Hi, Paul. Morning. Sit down. Paul, we just received a contract from the Air Force to write a film script on system program management. System program management? What's that? I don't know. But you'll find out. You've got plane reservations for a meeting at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base tomorrow. They'll fill you in on all the background material you'll need. Gentlemen, gentlemen, it's essential that we spread the gospel of system program management to all our project officers and contractors. We want our programs managed according to 375 procedures. It's taken us a decade to work out the management procedures that we feel will give us the best possible systems for the most reasonable costs and schedules. So, uh, Mr. Sullivan, what we want you to do for us is to write a film script explaining system program management to both contractors and Air Force personnel. Are you at all familiar with the 375 series manuals? No, sir. Well, we've brought along a copy of each of the manuals for you. The 375-4 manual contains about 200 major steps of the system life cycle. 375-1 covers configuration management. 375-5, systems engineering. And 375-3 is a general explanation of the system program office and its elements. And here are some of the more important regulations that govern the system management procedures. Uh, they may prove helpful. Uh, this is AFR 375-4, dealing with the system program documentation. AFR 375-3, the system program director. 375-2, dealing with the SPO. AFR 80-20, dealing with the definition phase. And AFR 375-1, uh, the parent regulation, dealing with the system management. Well, gentlemen, I'm sure that all this information will be very helpful, or at least it will be, when I understand what it is you're talking about. At the present, all I know is that you want me to write a film that deals with system program management. Now, I know it has something to do with systems and something to do with management. Both these words I use frequently in my own vocabulary. But I'm sure that you have a more particular use for these two concepts. Let's start at the beginning for a moment. What exactly is it you mean by these words? A short time ago, we made a film which was an introduction to system program management. I think after seeing it, you will have a pretty good idea of just what the Air Force means by a system and what the basic management concept is. Start the film, please. Take a facility, add a piece of hardware, some people and procedural data, integrate them and you have a system. A combination of equipment, skills and techniques ready to perform an operation. Since World War II, the United States Air Force has developed a variety of systems to meet the requirements of national security. But each new system developed may contain the seeds of its own obsolescence. And today's miracle may become tomorrow's monument. As pressures increase for the development of new and highly complex systems, New managerial concepts also must be developed to ensure the acquisition of the best possible systems in the most efficient manner. Before a system can be developed, it must support the national goals and objectives as determined by the executive and legislative branches of government. This determination is made through the Department of Defense programming process, which relates system development to national policy through the five-year force structure and financial program. Specific system studies are the responsibility of systems command. They originate from either using command needs or technological breakthroughs. 
Once the operational need for a system has been determined, authorization for a system study will be given to Systems Command. The study will be incorporated into the technological war plan and assigned to one of the systems divisions under Systems Command. At this point, system program management has its beginnings. Like a road map, which defines a route to be taken, system program management is built around the milestones to be accomplished in the development of a system. The route begins in an advanced planning office of a systems division. Here, conceptual phase activities are accomplished. The goal of these activities is to establish a logical and feasible system concept by means of planning studies and exploratory and advanced development. The results of conceptual phase activities are summed up in technical reports and recommendations and submitted to Systems Command and Headquarters USAF for approval. Headquarters then issues a Requirements Action Directive, which indicates its intention to acquire the system. A system program director is appointed as conceptual transition begins, and a system program office cadre is organized. The task of the SPO cadre will be to prepare the plans that will constitute the program requirements baseline. This program requirements baseline is submitted to Systems Command and the Secretary of Defense for approval. A system management directive is then issued, authorizing the SPO to proceed to the definition phase. The definition phase is divided into three parts. Phase A is primarily an Air Force effort, in which the system specification and preliminary plans and networks are prepared. At the beginning of this phase, the SPO cadre officially becomes the SPO. The goal of the SPO during phase A is to prepare for contractor definition. During phase B, the contractors selected will have the task of further defining the system. Their major tasks will be to complete the plans and specifications initiated during Phase A so that the output of their efforts will be a complete definition of total system requirements. During Phase C, the contractor's work will be evaluated and the SPO will update the baselines and prepare for acquisition phase activities. The activity accomplished during the definition phase and the recommendations for acquisition phase contractors must be approved by Headquarters Systems Command, Headquarters USAF, and the Office of the Secretary of Defense. Upon approval, a system management directive is issued, allowing the SPO to proceed. At the beginning of the acquisition phase, 
the SPO must ensure that well-defined baselines have been established to manage contractor efforts. The contractor now proceeds to design, develop, produce and test the system elements in order to deliver an integrated system for Category 2 testing. Upon completion of Category 2 testing, the using command is ready to assume responsibility for the system. The SPO continues to update documentation and assists to some degree in the Category 3 tests. When the last operating unit is accepted, the SPO turns over all system documentation to the using and logistics commands and the SPO is phased out. Did that help you, Mr. Sullivan? Well, quite a bit. Now, if I understand you correctly, what you want me to do is write a film about the procedures of system management, applying them to specific examples. Essentially, that's correct. Mr. Sullivan, I have a suggestion. Suppose we send you to our systems divisions. One of the technical advisors at this conference will meet you and show you around. At each division, you can research a different phase in the life cycle, say, a conceptual phase at Space Systems Division, definition phase at Aeronautical Systems Division, and so on. Uh, would this help you? Oh, yes, I'd, I'd like to see as much detail as possible. We have several things to show you while you're here in order to give you as good a picture of conceptual phase activities as possible. I'd like to ask you a frank question. I've been studying these manuals. Exactly how closely does the Air Force want you to follow them? Well, the procedures in the manual provide a chronological checklist which encompasses all major management activities on a large system. Sit down, please. However, a system program director has some latitude in applying these procedures to his specific program, and he can obtain waivers to parts of the manuals. Uh, you can check the forward to each of your manuals for a more detailed answer. Now, let's say that we need a specific system such as is represented here. We know we have the capability to put a payload into orbit. Now, we have a using command requirement to use that capability to develop a specific system. Here. Imagine this puzzle as the concept we're going to study. We'll call this concept uh, System X. Our first task is to break down this concept into the components that make it up. Now, each one of these pieces represents a subsystem concept. This may be the booster, this an optical subsystem, and so on. Now, what we've done is to break down our overall system concept into task areas of study. Well, what are those numbers there? Uh, those are the forms we use to uh, document our plans for studies. Now, at the end of these studies, what we have are the gross solutions necessary to satisfy the operational requirement for our system. You mean on paper it works, you think? Well, it's a little more than that. For example, as a result of our concept studies, uh, we'd be able to say that using an atlas agena combination, we could boost the required weight into orbit. But there are other areas where there are questions which would have to be answered. Uh, this is the next item on the agenda during the conceptual phase. Uh, let's visit the lab and take a look at an actual case. You'll remember that one of the task areas for study was an optical subsystem. Uh, let's say we don't know whether we can develop a lens with sufficient resolution to take photographs in space. Do you follow me? Yes. Uh, what we now have to do is to conduct exploratory development on the optical subsystem uh, to see if such a subsystem is technically feasible. Uh, by the way, exploratory development may go on all the time, independently of any particular project. We draw upon research sources as we need them. Now let's follow this experiment into advanced development. 
Before we finish conceptual phase studies, we'll have to be in a position to say whether or not our optical subsystem is feasible. Now, this may mean some advanced development, uh, actual testing in the field. What you see here could be a typical advanced development experiment. We could attach the camera to a non-related systems test, uh, say ride piggyback on somebody else's payload, and see how it would function under conditions approximating those of its intended mission. Well, if it does, then you've pretty well established technical feasibility. Right. Now, what we mean by system feasibility is really total feasibility. Through exploratory and advanced development of hardware, Plus, planning studies, we've identified the gross requirements that will give us an operational system which is technically sound uh, as far as we can determine. Now, what we're saying is that the system seems sound from all points of view. We'll be able to say that it's feasible because we have the technology in hand and we can achieve reasonable cost and schedules through use of existing facilities, hardware, and personnel. Thus, we should be able to tell headquarters what the requirements are, whether or not they can be met, how they can be met, and the major alternate approaches. Now, when all of our studies are completed, we submit the results to headquarters in a series of technical reports, along with recommendations to proceed with the system. We also submit two documents, an initial preliminary technical development plan and a program change proposal. If headquarters decides to acquire the system, they issue a requirements action directive. In response to the RAD, four documents. The preliminary technical development plan, a program change proposal, a military construction program, and a determination and finding are prepared before we can move into the definition phase. I see two of the plans appear twice. How important are the initial preliminary technical development plan and the program change proposal? Very important. The preliminary technical development plan is the fundamental plan for decision making on management and technical considerations throughout the life of the system. The program change proposal allows us to enter the program into the five-year force structure and financial program. Well, I can't get everything into a script. Now, why don't we just mention the initial plans briefly and then deal with the preliminary technical development plan and the program change proposal as they're prepared? Okay, uh, just as long as you get them in. So we'll start with the requirements action directive. Before an RAD is issued by Air Force headquarters, the uh, total feasibility of a proposed system has been established. The RAD spells out the gross requirements for that system. By using a requirements action directive, the Air Force states its need for our military capability. Let us imagine that an RAD to acquire a ballistic missile is issued. In it, we would find listed or referenced a variety of requirements which may deal with the plans and concepts for schedules, sites, operations, maintenance, personnel, and costs. In terms of operational requirements, the RAD would cover information such as thrust, launch, altitude, velocity, range, and kill. Once this is issued, the project enters conceptual transition and the SPO cadre is formed. And the SPO cadre contains the nucleus of the SPO elements? Uh, that's correct. Uh, one of the essential points I think that you should make is the role of the participating commands in the SPO. They contribute key inputs into the PTDP and throughout the life cycle. Well, what about GSE, TDC, and SEG, RTD engineers? <laughs> I see you're learning the language. Well, it's a matter of survival. But what's the difference between the two? GSE, TDC stands for General System Engineering and Technical Direction Contractor, such as MITRE or the Aerospace Corporation. SEGRTD is the System Engineering Group of the Research and Technology Division of Systems Command. The SPO doesn't do its own general system engineering, but manages the efforts of one of these Air Force or not-for-profit groups. They each furnish basically the same type of support to the SPO. Hmm. Well, now the problem I'm having is there's too much information to put into one picture. And especially when you 
come to discussing the documents. Now, the four documents you mentioned, I think that we should spend time with only the PTDP. Well, I have no objection to that, as long as you refer to the others. Uh, by the way, there are several other documents that have to be prepared during conceptual transition. One of the more important ones is the SPO activation plan. Oh, I missed that one. Well, it deals with requirements and resources that the SPO itself will need during the life cycle. The important thing is that it must be prepared and approved within 30 days after the SPO receives the RAD authorizing conceptual transition activities. But for your purposes, we'll deal with the PTDP. Well, let's make sure I understand the other plans. Now, the MCP is Military Construction Plan. Now, program. Military Construction Program. Right. Now, this plan, or program, is a plan for acquiring sites and facilities which must be constructed for the system. Well, that's pretty accurate. The MCP is primarily concerned with real property facilities. Real property. OK. Now, the DNF is determination and finding. And I'm a little confused about that. <laughs> well, the DNF goes like this. The desired procedure is to let government contracts on the basis of formal advertising. That is, a request for proposal is published, and anyone who wants to can compete. But in certain areas, especially those concerned with highly technical matters, the Air Force finds it better for our overall interest to negotiate a contract. The DNF is the means by which we obtain the authority to negotiate contracts. Well, now, the manual says the program change proposal is the means to establish the proposed system in DOD programming. This isn't clear to me at all. Well, all system programs have to be incorporated into Department of Defense programming. Approval of a system means incorporation into DOD's program. But in order to get this approval, we have to give DOD our best cost and schedule estimates to develop, produce, and operate the system, and how much manpower is needed. This information is the heart of the PCP. The PTDP is the spoke cadre's response to the RAD. The purpose of this plan is to spell out gross level requirements and our plan for developing the system. One of the efforts in the preparation of the PTDP is system engineering. Using the guidance in the RAD as a basis, the system is described in functional terms. One way to do this is to develop functional flow block diagrams, which broadly describe the functions required to accomplish the mission. Remember that RAD for a ballistic missile? Our top level functional flow block diagram for that system would show various major operation, maintenance, test, and activation functions. First, we would have development and qualification testing, then install and checkout, acceptance followed by monitor missile readiness, launch missile, and finally perform flight mission. Each function is then expanded. For example, the function launch missile could be expanded like this. Final countdown, stage one ignition, lift off and ascent, preparation for stage one separation, stage two ignition, preparation for stage two separation, payload separation. But although system engineering effort provides inputs into the PTDP, each element of the SPO cadre and each participating command is also responsible for specific inputs into the 17 sections. Well, how much detail is needed? It varies. There are usually gaps in our knowledge at this time. However, there is one section which requires a certain amount of detail, the definition plan. This section spells out the plans, the reviews, and the goals of the definition phase. One of the most important parts of this plan identifies the status of the definition phase prerequisites. Six prerequisites have to be met to obtain DOD approval to proceed to the definition phase. When the PTDP is completed, we submit our documentation to headquarters for approval. We must show them that we've completed all the prerequisites to the definition phase and that we've prepared plans which state what the requirements of the system are and how we plan to develop them. 
All we need now is direction and resources. This is given to us in the form of a system management directive which allows us to proceed with the definition phase. And that ends the conceptual phase? <laughs> Unless, of course, you really want to go into detail. 